All right, so we are on, just going live in three, two, one. Welcome to The Hive. This is Brian Wright. I am sitting down with my guest, Jason Teitelbaum. He is a old school Killer Bee member, not even really Killer Bee. He goes all the way back to when I started my career 20 years ago, and it was Eastern Sun, but Jay is... You're not the longest standing fighter because Henry came before you, but you are definitely number two, I think. So, yeah, you go way back with us. Done more fights than Henry. You've that done more. Count than for well, something. Actually, you've done more fights than anybody, I think, here. <laughs> so, I think the final count was was really. It was What the hell? The final count was. It's like. I think it was over 40. Yeah, it was, it was 39 and 9 with 19 finishes. Sounds about right. That's. Yeah, from 16 to 20 what? I mean, I, I don't 20, even think you went to 21, 22. I think 22 might have been my last year. I know I had one world Sabaki, that was 2006. So How old I was were you? 20. Yeah, and you didn't go much longer after that. You two, did a little bit more. About two years at most in kickboxing. Yeah, that's that. right. We did go on. A, yeah, but that's crazy. Think about it. Between 16 years old to 22 years old. Yeah. That's a lot of fights, Jay. <laughs> that's a lot of fights. So this the energy here is also brought to by Starbucks because I got coffee on the way here and then you just got me the largest cup of Starbucks I've ever seen. <laughs> if I just it, a large. If I finish it, I I may be speaking faster than I normally do or going to the bathroom, one or the other, <laughs> or having a heart attack. Yeah, I don't know if caffeine's going to stop me because <laughs> the amount of caffeine that I drink, um, I don't know if it's going to stop me. So, it's funny. It's like a family day. The title bounds and the Wright family are getting together. I haven't seen your dad in a while. He came in the other night uh, just to say hi, what's up. And then I told him we were heading down to sparring to brick at uh, Nick Tones today with Carl. And he was like, maybe I'll go. I was like, yeah, let's go. So, I spent the morning with your father. And I told him that you were coming in. He's like, oh, I didn't even know. So, you know, as, as usual, the title bound communication. Well, to be fair, we don't talk that much to begin with. And Not for my, because you have reasons. No, just, just because, because we're both the same person. Yes, and, and I have a broken cell phone on yeah. top of that currently. Mm-hmm. So there's, like, no communication with anybody. So when you guys actually have two functioning phones, <laughs> how much of your communication is verbal and how much via text? Ninety mm, percent of it is probably via text. Yeah, because the two of you are not big talkers. No, no, not even a little. And that's why I brought you on the podcast, which is purely audio, <laughs> because you are such an amazing talker. <laughs> but face see, to look, face, you're stuttering already. You're trying to get it out. <laughs> face to face is a different story. I can talk if you get me going on something, but in general, now I'll sit in the corner and just kind of keep to myself. Yes, that that can, is. Can I curse on here? Just so I know. Yes, you can curse okay. on here. It's not a problem. I, I, I'm working on it. I'm trying to curse less. Uh, not everyone appreciates the fact that in New Jersey, you know, fuck is pretty much a word that's every other. So. Right. It goes with the and. Yes. But. Yeah. And it, it's good in every scenario. I don't understand <laughs> the hesitation to use it. The over, you know, the amount of feelings people have for it. Like, relax. Yeah, it's relax. just relax. I'm not oh. calling you personally a jackass or something, even though I did say that the other day to a member here. And you know, and it, it wasn't honestly. You wouldn't. It wasn't. I take find a, that hard. Okay. Really. All right. I'm going to preface this though. So, we had a lot of snow. I last podcast mentioned that we got flooded out. So there's a there was something happened to the foundation on the outside and the snow from the snow removal was piled up so we had about 20 feet of snow at the back door and when it melted it went right into the foundation so i came in the other night to a thousand square feet of water so but (laughs) someone who was working out came in sends me a text going yo you're flooded out i'm like okay it's not like terrible but i hope you have insurance and I'm like, the whoa, kind of whoa, 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 whoa. This has to be, like, horrible. You tell me, do I? Do you have insurance? And I'm, I'm freaking out now. And I'm, right. I'm working on something else. I'm, I cut it off. I grab my kid, hop in a car, and I come flying over. And it was bad, but there was water. Hold on one sec. What's up, Ry? I love you. I love you, too. Now, see, this is the amazing aspect of family affairs. So today, my son's with me while we do this, and it's interrupting my story, but he just interrupted to say he loves me. Now, isn't that awesome? That's a very nice sentiment. Yeah, yeah, that's very nice. I feel very good right now. 
where was I? <laughs> so I come flying over, and the gym's got a ton of water in it, and the person who sent me the text is here. And I'm like, yo, jackass, you didn't preface it, nothing. You just said, I hope you have insurance. And I literally, I'm coming over thinking this is a catastrophic situation. Right, like but a foot of water on your floor or I'm something I'm thinking ridiculous. like the ceiling caved in, you know. I'm, right. I'm, this is my business we're talking about. And you say insurance, I'm thinking really bad. And I'm like, yo, jackass, send me a photo next time. Don't ask me if we have insurance. And she didn't appreciate the jackass part. And I, I guess I can understand, but here's how I look at it. So I said to her, I said, hey, next time, why don't you let me borrow your car? And then I'm going to text you, and I'm going to say, hey, um, something happened here. Do you have insurance? And let's see how quickly you go from Lose zero shit, to, yeah. like, oh, my God, what the fuck? You know what I mean? So, I was, uh, so we came to terms on it. I apologize for the jackass comment because maybe it wasn't necessary, but it made me feel better about my stress level at the time. No, no, but if she's a member here, then she should, she should know you, yes, and yes, it should really understand. shouldn't be that much of a surprise, or there shouldn't be that much butthurt over yeah, it. Yeah, I think, I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure she got over it. I don't know. I don't Listen. think you care if she t- <laughs> No, that's not true. Tracy's awesome. She's been with us forever. And oh, I definitely. Tra- okay. I would not I want, see I want to have, I don't have any, there's, honestly, right now, with the crew we've got, Wow, these are people that are not training here right now are going to be like, what, 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 what? Because I'm, I'm saying, with the people I've got, this crew now, there's nobody here that I, I would be like, yeah, whatever. I think um, we have a we have a pretty tight crew right now. I'm really happy with like the group of people that we have training. And I, I would be surprised if people left because they were unhappy because we're, we, ha- we just, we've been doing really good work lately. So let's put it that way. We've been having fun too. No, yeah, I just mean that anyone that knows you that's been yeah. here long enough. But don't say. But the don't point of, say that I would be that I would just be dismissive if someone left. No, I didn't I mean, mean it as dismissive. Because I'm a dick within context. Right. I understand when it's necessary. You know that. Come on. Sometimes people need you know a little kick in the ass, not you know the high five. Really good. You need that sometimes, <laughs> but sometimes you need a little motivation. And my motivation tends to be a little bit colorful with the language. That's all. Nobody knows that better than you do. So there's there's a bunch. Okay, I have to again remind everyone that Little B is here today. So you may hear in the background a dad here and there, and we may have to take like breaks to say, "What's up, buddy?" I want a break. You what? I want a break. You want a break? You want me to take a break? But I just got started. No. Come on, let me let me do my thing a little bit here. I want a break. To do what? All right, hold on one second here. Yeah, so now you're understanding the joys of parenting. I have no problem with being a parent. It's just my podcast is having a problem with me being a parent sometimes. <laughs> so, yeah. But where, where, where I was going, it was it was interesting. I, I was talking, I don't know with who. We're at like episode seven. I don't remember everything I've said at this point. So, But we did have a conversation not long ago. The business has changed a lot over the years. When we first started in this 20 years ago, which is, again, 2018, it's 20 years of me doing this. When I started in this, I was young. I was really young. I think you're younger than I am now. How old are you now? 32. Yeah, I was 24. Okay, yeah. I was 24 when I opened my first school. So I was really young, and I didn't know as much as I thought I did, and it took time to really mature into it. I was talking about this last guest was trent i had this guy trent hinman who trains here he's a professional race car driver which is pretty cool listen to episode six if you want to get more information about trent it's pretty cool he also came in i believe it was episode three or four so why don't you listen to all six episodes and then you can catch up on everybody but trent and i were just talking about training and i was talking about the evolution of training and one of the things was so at 24 i had particular ideas at 34 i had ideas and then at 44 i'm starting to understand i really had no idea what the fuck i was doing until i was you know, into my 40s, actually, which is scary. But um, you were there in the beginning, and you were the original, you know, tip of the spear. I, I, people know Carl Roberson now because he's in UFC, whatever. But you were my first Carl, is the way I like to okay. to preface it, because you were the first guy that went elite from nowhere. I mean, Carl is a dude from Neptune. There's nothing, there's there's no magic in his background that's saying, hey, Carl's going to be a professional athlete one day. No, he's just an animal. 
He, but he, but <laughs> but but just coming from nowhere to be something is a great story for him. Right. And the same thing for you because when you you come from Ocean Township. And Ocean Township is no hotbed of combat sports and never has been. I don't think there's ever been a combat sport athlete to ever come out of Ocean Township besides our facility. Yeah, and not, not outside of well, maybe I mean, the Greg wrestling, I was Greg say the wrestling community in Ocean is pretty big. But, but that but that community tops out. I don't know anybody that went past the first couple of years. Even the kid, what was the kid who won the States a couple of years ago? Uh, well, I say a couple you, years ago. It was probably like 10 years ago now. Are you talking about Soto? Or no, I know the Pembertons were good. Didn't but, we have a state champ come out of Ocean Township not long ago? When I say I, not long I ago, within know. the last decade. But I know he went to Rutgers, and I believe he hopped off the team by his sophomore year. Wrestlers have a weird thing, the pressure that they get under high school and they oh, go to right. college to get some freedom. It's hard sometimes, I understand. Yeah, you'd have to talk to Tom Wright about... Uh, yeah. He, 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 he knows a lot. Yeah. I think he coaches. He, you know the funny right part now. is? Yeah, he said that. It's because Rant actually had the same experience. He went to Rutgers, full ride for wrestling. Okay. I think he was done with wrestling by his sophomore year. Okay. It, it's it's just like the sophomore curse with a lot of these guys. So, yeah, in terms of combat sports for Ocean, it's again, it's not some hotbed. You know, Greg Soto made it to the UFC, which is very commendable. We worked with him for a little bit, too. I went to the UFC with him. Um, I was with him for his last fight. Um but there's something I don't know what it is. It's weird. In areas, there's are some places. I guess we say there are some cities, some inner cities that just have the right structure and programming to take people that are in hard situations and give them the ability to focus. Then you take Ocean Township. I'm going to just say it's a soft town. I mean, this is a really soft yeah, town. It's, it's middle upper middle class this easily. Is easily, not, yeah. yeah. This is upper upper middle class and upper class kids. There's not a lot of motivation to fight your way out of anything. <laughs> You know? Or a reason to. Yeah, there's no reason to. <laughs> That's some, yeah, so to come to combat sports and excel in it, that's why it's kind of a rarity here. And for you, you started, we were six, I think you were 16 when we started to do work. Yeah, I want to say it was 2001, Terry brought me to you. Yeah, and you had been with him for a while, but you weren't really serious about it. When I was it. really young, I trained with him from six years old till I think about 10, and then... He lost his dojo. Then about two or three years later, my mom ran into him at like the food store or something. And we started training again. And then I think two or three years after that, uh, he brought me over to you so that we could do something more serious with it. Yeah, and then then everything went from there. And the, the thing... There, the couple points we fight over what weight you were. You you can you can define your weight wherever you want. But how tall are you now? Five five. How tall were you then? Five five. And how much did you weigh when you started? About two forty. Two thirty five. Two forty. Yeah, do the math if, if on you, it. If, if you I'll keep talking to you about I'll it, leave it, it alone. You're, th- you're like 320 by the time yeah, we're exactly. done talking about it. But you were you were heavy. You were, I was a you fat were, piece of shit. Well, you were obese. Let's put it For that my way. height yeah. and age, crazy. I was a fat piece of shit. The crazy part is if you go by the government standard of height to weight ratio, you're actually still obese, which is ridiculous. I'm actually obese at my height, which is <laughs> insane because I'm, I'm not. It's just Carl's right. obese. Carl has like five percent body fat, and they'll be like, "You're obese because your height yeah, to weight he's ratio six foot sucks." And, uh, and whatever yeah. he is, it, yeah, it doesn't it, make any sense. It doesn't make sense. But you were really big when you oh, started, yeah. and you were in no shape, no nothing. But uh, I don't, I don't know. It, it, that's like the one part of it, and then the other part of it was you picked it up so fast that at sixteen you had to start. I think you had one tournament as. A junior, and then we had to put you in adult because you were too strong for juniors. Because you smashed some kid, and then we were like, you can't fight kids for anymore. For full contact or semi-contact? Full contact karate. We put you in. We Well, you fought. No, my, from what I remember. You fought on, in my tournament. And when we held our tournament in Eatontown, you fought. And that's when you met. That's when. when Joffer. And, so when I, yeah, that sounds about right. And that you was were, semi-contact. And you guys were all in, like, you were all juniors then. And that yes. was semi. It was full contact, but you had shin guards on, whatever. Yeah. So, But then. After that, you went to the adults because you yeah, were too you, strong. At 16, you put me in the tournament out in Canada and, and Vancouver. You, yep, because you were just too strong. You couldn't fight. You couldn't fight kids, and you killed men out there. Yeah, literally killed <laughs> men out there. Like I think the trophy came with a shovel, so you could bury the bodies. It was that was bad. So not but, bad for my first full contact fight. No, but the cool, and you put a hole in my ribs a month before it. I 
I don't remember? Forget. No, I remember. I actually have videotape of that somewhere. <laughs> VHS. Luckily, luckily, we switched over from VHS to digital formats, and that doesn't fly. It's anymore. probably floating around somewhere. Though. Somewhere floating like your rib. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. So whatever. It happens. Come on. It just happens. I told no, you. I, I was know. young. I was dumb. But the thing was, you came in. You were really out of shape. Your your weight wasn't proportionate to your height. And not even close. But you did the work. The weight came down. And you fought. You started off as heavyweight. And then by the time, I think your last fight was 145. I fought through every weight class from 195 down to... I think it was supposed to be either 145 or 150. I weighed in at 148, and that was the lightest I'd ever been. You're right. That was 147, and then the pound. Yeah, they gave. Yeah, they gave it to me. Wait a minute. Okay, uh, it's a longer story than what I'm about to say, but that was the fight that the weight class was 147, and anyone who knows fight sports knows that you get one pound over. And that was when the guy came in, and he was six pounds over. And they said, yeah, we have a six-pound weight allowance. I'm like, so you literally have another weight class. You have another weight class well, that allowance. Was, that would have been 155. So, that would have been my normal And he showed class. up at that. He, he Remember that? that was, I don't think you actually told me the specifics no, that of was, that. No, that was the one. Like I, we almost, I almost got into a fight with the promoter and the coach in the back over that one. That okay. one was insane. So, my son wants to give me a hug in the middle of this, so we'll continue doing this. So, but yeah, that was that was the one, and then that one to make matters worse, that was the fight that they told us was five rounds, told them three rounds, and then so after no, the no, third no, round no. they stopped it. No, that, that was, was a diff- that was a different one. That one was up in Brooklyn. That one I think was for possibly a title, and that was yes. one of my last fights. I thought that was no, your you're last fight. About, that was um, what was your last fight? Then? I, that might have been my last. That fight. was your but last. The one forty seven one I thought was against Kilikowski. Kitakowski, you fought there, but that's why we went to the next fight at the same. You stayed down there. You didn't go Did back I? up for that. Yeah, you were. Okay, you went, you stayed down because you had just fought at 150 in Denver. Okay. So you had fought at 150. For what did I fight in Denver? Kyokushin or Kyokushin? Um, no, the that, Sabaki was yeah. 155. Okay, so you did Sabaki and then we went to Canada and then we came back for that kickboxing bout. So they all kind of oh, rolled, right. remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah, all kind of yeah. rolled. That sounds about right. And because it was too many fights in a short period of time, it which I want to get, but I'm going to get to that too. <laughs> uh, you know, so that that was that was that was crazy. But the point which we're kind of getting <laughs> to with the too many fights in one period of time, the issue. So the inexperienced aspect of it, we did the best we could with the amount of information that we had at the time. And it's funny, but I do look back at at what we did. I don't regret anything we did, but there's that itch where I see a lot of the stuff that you and I did in particular. And I'm like, man, if I only knew now, if I only knew then what I know now, what could we have done? But then the other side of it is... The fight, the fight community at that time, compared to what the fight community is today, was a whole other world too. Right. MMA like wasn't even an option today. for us. Yeah. But MMA wasn't an option because there no. was nothing going on there. I mean, then it was UFC when it had 50 people in it, and then there was Pride. And then there was K1, which we flirted with, but the problem with K1 was it was either you were fighting at 155 or you were fighting at heavyweight. And the problem was for you with your height. Even at 155. You, 55, you're fighting six foot tall guys. Mm-hmm. And in Japan, with them on vitamin S and, you know, the crazy weight cutting. Yeah, uh, yeah, and guys t- taking pints of blood out to make weight and all this kind of stuff. See how, see how nice he is? My son just closed the door for us so that he doesn't interfere with our sound. Good little man. But... Yeah, it was just one of those times where you didn't have the variety of options that you have today. Kickboxing today I, is pretty much dead. I mean, there's glory, which is fine, but... It was dying back when I was doing it, so well, by now... <laughs> yeah, the, you were either a superstar or a bum. There was no right. in-between. So you either were a K-1 superstar or you were fighting in bum shows for no money. Where now, you're either fighting in bum shows for no money or fighting in glory. It's still the same problem. And even glory... <laughs> For career-minded guys with kickboxing, it's tough. Glory doesn't pay great. I mean, you're, there's no way that you're going to be an entry-level kickboxer in an organization like Glory and not have another job. There's okay. no other way around it. Where the UFC is a different story. If you make it into the UFC, if you get enough fights in a year, you, you can live you off are, that. Right? Yeah. And sponsors are good. And if you have the right management, like we hooked up Carl with a great management team with Sucker Punch Entertainment. Plug, plug, plug. But <laughs> they've been great. They make sure that he's taken care of and everything. And the UFC has I mean, a ton of stuff. Um, 
yeah, we just different time. Didn't have the opportunities that we have now. So, I, but again, how old you're? You're 32 now. Yeah. God, I, I it's hard for me to accept that you're 32 because that means that how old I am as well. So. It's very tough. Like, I always think of you as still as that 16-year-old. This is the old man in me talking right now. So, it's crazy. I mean, look at your dad. How old is your dad now? Holy shit. He's he like 50, 50 what? almost 60. Yeah. I think he's turning 58 this year. Yeah, and I'm going to be 44. It's crazy. It's crazy. So, time, time, doesn't, time doesn't sit still for anybody. But, yeah, there's totally been an evolution in opportunity, evolution in the way we've done stuff, and... It's an evolution in sport in general. And I've matured as a coach and understood things, you know? I, 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 uh... Daddy, I need a question. What's up, buddy? I need a question. All right, my son's got a question. Let's see what this is. This could be the mystery question of the interview. This could be very interesting. What's up, buddy? What's the question? Okay, that wasn't a question. That was, a, that was an order. So I just got an order from my son that when we go home, I build the Doc Ock Lego that we got at Toys R Us to try and make sure that we're nice and distracted for this interview, which obviously is not occurring. So, But yes, Brian, I will, I will build Doc Ock. So if anyone's curious to what I will be doing tonight, <laughs> I will be building a Doc Ock Lego at my house. It's, it's super big. And it's super big. And it's a robot. Yes, that's true. All right. So Jay's like, thank God I only have a dog. But that's okay. <laughs> uh, if you ask my wife, she's not even happy about that. But Yeah, so basically with it all, the difference, you know, there's been like big evolution over the years between opportunity and training and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I don't want to do the woulda, shoulda, coulda, but, it, the, it, it, you know, it just uh, – yeah, if you had the opportunities today uh, that we have today, then it, w- it could have been a different ride. But whatever, man, it all it all works out the way it works out, and it did give you the foundation to do some other cool things. And uh, you just got back from the world's strongest man, and that's why I wanted to really bring you in. Was not just to talk old school, but to kind of find out what you're up to now. Yeah, old school is always fun, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how? So when did you get into the? When did you get it? Because it's not really. It's not powerlifting. No, it's, it's strongman. It's strong. When did you get into strongman? Uh, and how? What year? I'd say. Um, I mean, I started dabbling in powerlifting. I don't know, five or six years ago. It was a couple of years after I basically retired from fighting and got fat, and then started messing around with powerlifting. Competed a couple of times, and then tweaked the hell out of one of my shoulders. And then after that, I mean, you know, we've all seen World's Strongest Man on ESPN back yeah. in the day, and I always loved watching that. And then I think um, basically a guy at a gym that I was going to, he used to compete. Uh, he used to compete, and he dragged me up to one of his buddies' place up in North Jersey. Uh, just for like a you know just for a training session because i'd never outside of seeing the guys on tv I, you know i didn't know there's actually weight classes there's you know not there's any money well in it, it's way more organized than you anticipated it's very grassroots but at the same time yes there are organizations i mean to, i saw photos from the the world's strongest man it looked like a crossfit competition i mean it looked organized Oh, yeah, no, it absolutely was. I mean, that one was by the actual, I believe the parent company is IMG, um, but it was the guys that do the World's Strongest Man on, well, now it's ABC, NBC. I forget who ended up picking them up. But it's the, the official World's Strongest Man. It's the only organization, contest, whatever, that is allowed to use that. And did they evolve? For, so from watching it in the 90s on tv it evolved from that into something else or what no it's still the same it's still the same sport really um the weights that the guys handle now it's been a huge evolution in sport like but i never saw weight classes before too it's like who is literally the world's strongest man period those are all the i want to say it's the over 231 pound class and again, back then, you know, in the '90s, and even well, it started in the '80s. Generation S. 
Generation S. Come on, you got to be real about it. Eighties and nineties, those guys were all just started monsters. In Seventy eight or seventy seven with, but uh, how many of those guys are dead now? A couple of them. Yeah, a hearts, couple of the, hearts explode. John Paul Sigmason is. I probably pronounce his name terribly, but uh, he died. I think ninety three. Way too young. So it was definitely something. But <laughs> but yeah, a handful of them definitely have. But the weights that they used then are weights that like the the two hundred pound and the two thirty one pound men's class use today. Like it's it's just ridiculous. Now, is that because training methods are better? I mean, is drug testing a big part of this? No. Really? There. Uh, I think they say for like the official world's strongest man, there are drug tests. Did you uh, get drug tested? No. Nope. Did you see anyone get drug tested? No. no. There, there really is no drug testing, as far as I know. To be perfectly honest, I don't want to screw you with your community, <laughs> but how many people in your community do you think are using? Not as many as you might assume. Why? It's just one of those things. I, You're assuming you know what I would assume. Mm, I'm going to assume that you're going to assume it's a high I would number. think 80% of your elite. Well, okay, let's put it this way. Your top three finishers, I would say 80% of them are going to be on something. For the bigger classes? For the bigger guys. I'd say probably. I honestly don't know. I know you don't know, but I mean, guess. I mean, you can see, you can look at a guy and you can tell in a lot of ways what's going on. Yeah. There's a fair amount of usage. Again, not knowing, you're probably looking at. Well, is there prize money in this? Well, that's what that's what I was going to allude to. Is there's no, all right? So yeah, there's basically no money in the sport for the, especially for the lighter guys. The only real money is for the the guys that were on TV, the super heavyweights. Um, and when have, you say with money on that, like how much money? What's like max? Like what are these guys making? Nobody. For the, for the it's not like anybody's a millionaire off this. For the big boys, yeah. Um, I think the biggest prize in strongman is the Arnold Classic Festival in Ohio, and that's usually around seventy thousand dollars, which is a pretty good, decent um, payday. Yeah. For once a once a year show, you can win a seventy grand. So if you have your own gym, you're selling something, right? I know sponsors. Oops. That that then then you can you know. Yeah, some of the bigger guys do You're not going to be a millionaire off of this, though. Probably not, no. I mean, I know um, Big Z, Zajunas Saviskas, he is a politician back home in Lithuania. He has, like, five gyms. So it's still a passion. He he does all right. It's a passion sport. Absolutely. The top guys do well enough that, you know, they don't have to work another job, but they're also, I mean, their life, especially at that size. But when... when, your fight career was over. Is it? Did you did you miss having a competitive situation to stay in shape? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why you got that, into this. Yeah, that's why that I got kind of led you into it. That's why I got into powerlifting. That's why I ended up getting into strongman. It's really funny because you this combat sports was was your sport in your youth in a lot of ways. Where a lot of people come to combat sports out of. You know, they they come out of the youth programs, and there's nowhere for them to go, right. and they're missing the team atmosphere, they're missing the training, they're missing the focus, and then they get into combat sports. But for a guy like yourself who's retiring from combat sports at a very young age, well, what do you do now? Right, and that is when you go from I don't know how many hours a week I was training with you, but it was like what three to four hours a night. Well, no, I, I mean, we can get, we'll go That's into a that. A little, okay. We'll get into that one because <laughs> I actually, I, I, I did want to talk about how hard we used to actually go to kind of juxtapose what we do today versus what we did back then. But I can tell you for myself. So I was, uh, I was 39 years old sitting at a wedding with my wife and I was at a table of people that are all talking and I just didn't f- feel like I belonged. And I was sitting there and I, I'm just, I wasn't ready to be a civilian yet, and I said, I just don't want to be this. I need to do something, and that's when I texted Justin from Friday Night Fights while I was sitting at the table and decided to do that last fight I did because (laughs) I literally sat there too going, I'm struggling with, I was, why train? Because when you're an athlete, when you're a fighter, you, you train because you have a goal, you have a fight, so that's why you train. But when you don't have a fight... What's the point of training? Yeah, that's so, that's always been the problem. And it always and and it's funny because I've yelled at people my entire life. Oh, 
are you a martial artist or a fighter? Because if you're a fighter, you only train when you have a fight. But if you're a martial artist, you train every day because you enjoy the martial arts, whatever. It's about the past. And then I realized I was completely full of shit because when <laughs> I didn't have a fight to train for, I really had no motivation to train. And if I didn't have a guy to spar with or a reason to spar, so when I when I stopped sparring for a while, then I'm like, well, I don't need cardio because no one's trying to hurt me and whatever. And I enjoy teaching the martial arts, but and I do enjoy doing them. But it, it, it was very difficult to get up on a daily basis and say, okay, let's lift, let's run, let's hit the bag, let's do no, this. No focus. Because, yeah, like th- without having a, a goal, the purpose of it kind of got weird. So from teaching, I always had a purpose because I always have somebody with something coming up. Right. But without me having something coming up, well, why do I train? I, I didn't understand why you had so many fat coaches. And then I'm like, oh, <laughs> I get it. But then I kind of needed that one more time to have that goal so I could really see how far I could push myself because I knew I wouldn't have pushed myself as hard as I did if I didn't have something like that coming up. So, I mean, I completely get it. And, and that's the, the maturation process of this whole thing for myself too because there's a lot of things that I would speak of that I hadn't gone through yet because I was too young. But now sitting here at 44 and personally – going through the full cycle of a fight career, going through being a fighter and a coach to just being a coach, to then realizing that I wasn't done being a fighter, burying my career on purpose, like best thing I ever did for myself, going out and doing that fight. Like literally, like that was, I was talking about it with Trent the other day. When I, when I first fought in the World Sabaki Challenge, it was the hardest physical thing I ever did. And then when I had my last fight at 40, that was the hardest physical thing I ever did. And the difference between the first time and the last time. The first time scared the crap out of me. The last time, it was like a warm blanket. That pain was just like, oh, okay. I, I, I remember you. I remember you. And I still have it there, but I was able to walk away from it. The first time scared the crap out of me, but I knew I had a career. This time, it was the one-shot deal, got it done, whatever. And I was able to move forward. And then I've actually been coming to terms with the motivation to train for myself and the different things I knew. So definitely going from being a fighter to more of a civilian mentality is a massive transition that takes a lot of time. It takes time and it takes introspection. Like you really do have to understand yourself more because you don't really have to understand yourself when you have someone to go fight. You just know you have a fight, so you just do it. You don't have to think that much. You just train and you get ready and you go and you just focus on the guy. But when you don't have a guy, you got to focus on yourself. And it's totally different. So the whole the struggle changes. Yeah, I can, it, I can I can imagine that. I can see that. So you're so instead of having an opponent, you have a competition. You've yeah, got it's you've got still, things to do. Right. And that's, And you're young enough too that you can do this for a long time. Uh, so, absolutely. If I'm smart about it, at least and you reasonably were, smart about it and you didn't you've never had aspirations to be a coach so for me i never got to, i i've never stepped out of the sport because coaching was really my primary focus from the beginning right where that's never been a a thing for you so God, that's no. fine but yeah <laughs> but seriously like, again it's it's like you know a grappler or a striker you punch somebody in the mouth they try and take you down they're a grappler if they want to hit you back they're a striker and then when it comes to like, people it's like you either you either train to train you fight or you coach or whatever but it's like you know when push comes to shove you're like fuck no I don't want to work with other people I just want to do my thing so you're not a, right. you're not a coach no. <laughs> so God, you're a no. practitioner of what you do and that's why I think the strongman stuff works good for you because you've got your goal and you can really throw yourself into it and you're good at that um the one thing, I, I, it was funny, I was even talking with your father about it. The difference between Carl and you, for me, was that uh, I, we used to make the joke, you were my personal PlayStation. Because I used to sit in the corner, right. I called out, you did yeah. it, and we won. Like, we <laughs> literally, like, it was, it was like, you know, I, I just, that was our relationship. You did what I told you to do, and you hurt people, and it was good. Right, I had the uncanny ability to have a completely empty head. <laughs> and, and I could you would fill just, it with whatever yeah, I wanted you to. You just fill it with commands. <laughs> And with Carl, Carl thinks about fighting the way I do, so okay. I don't have to give him instructions as much as reminders. It's okay. different. So I don't say, do this. I'm like, remember this is what we do? Very different. Okay. So if I'm not there, 80% of what he does is still going to be what I was going to tell him to do. Mm-hmm. With you, if I wasn't there, in a lot of ways you didn't know what to do. Kind of, sort of, yeah, I can see that. I mean, that. you became I mean, a bludgeon at the end. You were just a physical machine. <laughs> but at the same time, the nuance side of it 
Well, you right, replied, that, you relied on me for that the, the guidance for the nuance side of it. Absolutely, you wouldn't pick up on certain things. No, no, I, I've always been a bludgeon. That that's yeah, you're just a blunt you know, instrument. Yeah, it's uh, on the crowbar, not the not the katana. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's fine. If it, we figured out how to make it be Work. successful, yeah. so that's fine. And Carl and I have figured it out too. Uh, it, I say it all the time. Everybody's different. I was even saying it today. I was at sparring. We had a, a, a couple guys that have been playing with the ideas that I that I use, and I ha- I was like, okay, I can train all four of you to do the principles that are what I do, but you're all going to implement them different. Where before I didn't understand that to the same degree, I felt. Everybody should be doing the same kind of thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what I mean. So appreciation of the individual was not really there. No. But that's my own fucked up upbringing too through karate too. Because they right, brainwash you to the mentality. fucking cookie cutter thing. Yeah. So allowing you to be yourself is not really part of that world that we came up in. Nah, it's super old school mentality. What, what's the Japanese proverb about the nail that the row yeah. nails and the, yeah, the, the, one the nail that up. rises above the board, the instructor's job to is to come and hammer it back yeah. down. And I think the American understanding of that is different than what it was intended also. <laughs> because I do understand the idea of nailing the nail back down. And I think it's more of a empathy and humility thing as much as a uh, freedom issue. I don't think freedom's the issue. I think it's it's... When you have I, – the problem for me is not that they're going off the reservation and going against what I'm saying or going against what I'm trying to do technically as much as they're losing the focus of why we do what we do. you got to ground them back down because for us, the idea is that we are all working – we're working as a group towards individual goals where before I think it was we were working towards a as a group towards my goal. <laughs> <laughs> You can understand yeah, that better yeah, than anybody. Yeah. You Absolutely, get that. Absolutely, yeah. Because you were in that. Yep. I don't have a problem admitting it. I get it. I know. I know what it was. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and lie and act like it was like utopia. There was, some, <laughs> there was some fucked up things going on because of a complete misunderstanding of how to create effective human beings. Simple as that. But I was raised a particular way and I didn't know. And I've come across things over time that have made me understand things a little bit differently. And, yeah, so, yeah, evolved to understand it. So, yeah, I mean, you're sitting here laughing because you know (laughs) how dead on that is. You're (laughs) absolutely right. (laughs) You know, this was, it was my gym, my way, my house, my style. You represent me. It was me, 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 me. Or piss off. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You want to wear my black belt. You want to rep my gym. I. I see it now, and I'm like, God damn, I can't. I don't. I don't know how anybody can survive under those kind of rules. I see a lot of people that do. They survive, but I wouldn't want to anymore. I don't want that. I honestly don't want that. I've evolved w- way past that point. No, but I think it did deliver a certain level of, and part of it could have just been the way we were doing things. But it, it delivered a certain kind of hardness and mentality that can really go a long way in everything else. Well, the, part of that, though, too, is at 34, still being active, I could smash anybody that came in. Yes. And I smashed all of you. Yep. But I, And I'm not saying that like I was better than you. No, I physically could keep up with you guys. And I, and I physically pushed you guys. And I would consistently say, you know, I can do it. Why can't you? <laughs> over and over. And if I had to be the hammer, I was. We're now... It's different. I'm not saying I can't. I really don't want to be the hammer. It's physically harder to be the hammer. <laughs> but it's just, it's. I'm getting older. I get it. And I mean, I have a, I'm married. I got a kid. I've got other things going on. You know, I don't live in the gym and I'm not, you know, kicking the hard heavy bag every day and whatever. But it's just, it's different. And I, where before, too, the, the self-sufficient concept wasn't really there. Where I think... Now, I would rather create people that can stand on their own and represent the group than have to all of us constantly stand together to represent, if you know what I mean by that. Where, so. If we're together, great. But if we're not, you're strong enough on your own. Right. That's the thing. Like, you know that we're there because you're so strong now. You can do this on your own. When you're doing a lift, there's no one helping you. No. 
And I don't want you to have any doubt in your mind at all that you can't do it. So the, the thing there too, and this is where I think the value of what we did is that I do think you have that to a degree where the audacity to attempt hard things because we were we were no, hard. Abso- absolutely. We were hard. That, that is something that I reflect upon. If, I, if I'm really pushing to do something that I probably shouldn't even be trying to do, that's stupid, I will reflect on some of the accomplishments that I've done under you and just, just our give, way. give it a, give it a freaking go. Just. I don't I don't I don't want it to I don't I and, and I don't want it to be like the under me thing because the one thing we definitely have to recognize is that as much as me as I could have spoken to it that in those times the reality of it is is that we all pushed together I may have been the whip but you did the work right you figured out the work you know and so yeah when we were doing our thing we did some crazy things we pushed ourselves really far so you know it was a very unpleasant experience (laughs) but as unpleasant as it was looking right we had some amazing times it was great i wouldn't change really anything because the push like the ability that what we figured out how far we can go to have that chip on your shoulder when you're standing with people other people like you know how far you've gone and when right you, you can recognize people that haven't real fast <laughs> real fast <laughs> absolutely you can see the the, the soft real yeah. quick yep and you know fake versus real too you know you know the guy who's 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 fake hard the guy oh, yeah. the guy who's it's... acting like he's pushed but has no clue <laughs> you know that that's just the ultimate reality check on all this so like I, I know for myself, I joke about even in business, I can walk into a meeting and um, people try and intimidate me in words. I'm like, I'll snap your neck with one hand. Like, fat and out of shape, I'll still snap your neck. Like, <laughs> I, I outrun you. I'll outlift you. I'll out everything you just because I'm just wired to go that way. Where I, I, I just laugh. So when I see a weight, I, I'm like, yeah, I understand why Jay can put that weight up. I can understand why Jay's finding success in what he's doing because he was built to be successful. Well, thanks. <laughs> well, I mean, it's true though. But think about it. You put yourself in the position and you didn't quit on it and you always pushed. Like, why would you have any doubt in your ability to push? Because you've pushed so far, you know? Right. That's the whole right. thing. And one of the cool – one of the – one of the – the the – the lessons I got out of our career together was the appreciation of ultimately getting the victory that we wanted, but realizing when we got it that there were other parts that were actually, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for, but there was more depth to them. When you went to the, your first world sabaki in particular, that one, that was just, that was wrong. It didn't work. That just <laughs> didn't. That didn't go right. No, no. There, that really didn't go right no, did in not. any way. The training was tough. The fight was terrible. It was yeah, just the a matchup bad, was awful. I think was I was just, a weight class heavier than I should have been. 180 instead yeah, of 155. Yeah, should not have. But then you came back the next year. Yeah. And you you basically took, took third, third against a Japanese guy. But that was probably. The, I think that was the best you in knockdown I ever saw. Even better than as, in, as a te- like as a technical as fight, all around being challenged because you had a couple fights. It wasn't just one fight. Um, no, I went through. I either had two or three that because day. you had a huge division. So yeah, and, it had to be two or three fights that day. Easy. And you lost that fight, and the fight you lost was literally off one yep. goddamn sweep. Yep. I threw a high kick that I probably and shouldn't have, and... He swept you perfect oh, yeah, on that. Did. And that was just a great tournament. And then you come back the next year, and you win it, but it was almost anticlimactic because it was almost easier to win it. You that know? year, yeah. That year, you just kind of walked through it because you were just that good. You were that evolved at that right. point. You were evolved at a point where it was... Like, it was there was no doubt... To anyone in that room that you were going to win in that day. <laughs> Everyone knew. They knew. They were depressed. Like <laughs> The guys that ran this show, they were like, oh, crap. Somebody outside our group is going to win today. They knew. They couldn't do anything about it. You earned that. I mean, yeah, you, I basically you, spent the whole year training towards that 
just that competition. And you won the Northeast, and you won the U.S. Capitol. Pretty much every and you one won of the satellite everything. tournaments. Yeah, two you or just three smashed years in everything. A row. And that that trip, that's one of those journeys that it was like over a three year period where we went from really st- like. You belonged, but you struggled to get a spot at the table to then really making yourself known. The head of the table. To then <laughs> being the man. And they were glad when you never came back. <laughs> they were like, thank God he's not coming back because we don't want him to win anymore. And then there was the, the, um, and the, the two years back-to-back when we went to Virginia for the U.S. Capitol, the one year when... You know, we took the top two spots in lightweight, and then we. Oh, took, that was fun! And then we won the, and then we swept the women's division, and we swept the kids' division, <laughs> and we swept everything. <laughs> and then that that like we just had that two years. What that was when you were really yeah, at it was your, at 05 you were, and 06 you were at your best. That was that was when you were really on point. Everything was working really well. Yeah, and that's when the hard style kind of paid off, and yeah, that 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 was a that was a. It was just a, a good spot. And it's funny because then that rolled into an evolution even in the gym with the MMA team. Like the fuel that we got off that, like just even me as a coach, like that was the that was the energy I needed to like go into the next round of coaching where then I had – that's when the MMA team was huge too. That's when we had, you know, we had 10 guys a month fighting at one point when it was crazy. Yeah. We were just – that was just nuts. That was just a crazy time. We just had so many people fighting, which then rolled over into when we moved into Asbury. Then I had that whole fight team then where I had Sullivan and Haskins and, yeah, that, that's, and all these guys. That was just that. – but it all started with knockdown. That's where we really cut our teeth as a competitive team, and that's why I'm, I look at you as like a plank owner of the gym. I mean you really own the first round of the school, and the, the beauty of it is that you did it in a way that no one – can challenge because it was so hard because we trained so hard nobody can tell me that they've had it harder <laughs> no one can come here and say well, i mean they could tell you whatever they want but <laughs> yeah you could tell me but i'm nobody's gonna believe you and jay's gonna laugh in your face like your yeah. dad this morning your dad's like these guys are all soft i'm like no i was like shh those six guys well, that, are in, those six guys are in the that, ufc please do not say that around them it's like they're that, soft that, they don't know what a low kick is I that, punch a that, hole in them, especially with my old man, and I'll say it even for myself. That that is something that it always comes back to, and that I think that I think MMA in general is kind of lacking is when we always we cut our teeth in full contact. Even when you started getting into MMA and kickboxing, you still had the guys doing their prelim fights in knockdown. Yeah, there, there was a certain level. That they had to be proficient in knockdown because and so, they just made them that much harder. And for people that are listening that don't understand what knockdown karate is, it's not karate as you know it. Karate, or I don't know, maybe you do know it. I could be assuming the worst here. You could but, be a crazy old man. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is about knockdown karate is that there's no pads. You wear a cup and a mouthpiece, and the rule structure is such that you can kick and knee the head, but you can't punch the head, but you can punch the body. So it's kicks to the legs, body, and head punches to the body but it's bare knuckle and the only way to score points is to knock somebody down and meaning knock them down not push them but you have to fit the, you, you have, have to hurt them. You, it's like boxing in a knockdown so if you hurt a guy and he stops they do a count and it's a five second count if you don't get up in five seconds you lose if you get up in five seconds it's a half point it's only a full point to win so if you drop a guy twice you win if you drop a guy and he can't get up in five seconds you win so knockdown is pretty brutal because without the face contact with the hands guys are standing toe to toe and bare knuckle pretty much smashing the body and you have to worry about knees and bare shins coming at your head so yes knockdown is pretty tough i i would definitely agree out of all the combat (laughs) sports i think endurance wise i think physical endurance the ability to take pain and give punishment take punishment whatever i i don't know too many combat sports that are, are as hard as knockdown I think knockdown. You have to. Ha- it has to be the biggest mental fortitude sport. Would be knockdown as yeah. a combat sport. I and think. lungs. You have to have lungs. Oh, if okay. you don't have gas, don't you're even, dead. Yeah. yeah, you're dead. <laughs> There's no. And 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 two. Like kickboxing with the gloves on. Once you add head contact, you have to watch your pace because if you stand and swing toe to toe, somebody's getting knocked out. So you have to yep. pace it different. So the cardio is not the same. And then when you have it, still MS- sucks. But <laughs> and. 
going back to the MMA, when I know coming from knockdown, and even coming from kickboxing, guys will look at MMA and they'll be like, ah, oh, they're a little bit soft. But you got to remember. So you go from knockdown, then you go to kickboxing. So you're adding some different techniques, which doesn't slow it down, but it changes the game. But now you go to MMA and you add a whole nother layer of technique. It's, it changes the game that much more. So we're knocked down. You have no choice but to stand toe-to-toe and blast away. Then in right. kickboxing, you want to blast away, but you have to be a little bit more surgical because your your head's exposed to punches. But then in MMA, now you got to worry about the takedown. Now you got to worry about submissions. you got to worry about ground and pound. You've got to worry about all these different things. Going from two dimensions to three dimensions. To, and then to four dimensions, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. You know. oh, fuck that. So <laughs> it's, it's just, I hated MMA. <laughs> yeah. I mean... Because you just want to get to business, and you don't have right. to worry about somebody screwing up your business by trying to take you down. You know, uh, exactly. So it, it, it's Daddy, it's. Yeah, so, I mean, it literally goes to, like, four dimensions, and it's just a whole nother situation. But, I mean, one thing, too, spectators from the sports, people who would think when you say karate, they're not thinking of damage. No, I mean... They don't understand what we did. Most people think of it as basically taekwondo or point, just point fighting, because like that's, the Olympics. Yeah, because that's the, what most people know The majority of people in America do. So, but where, you know, there's a whole nother world of full contact karate out there, which yeah. is another beast. And then... You know, even with kickboxing, people know Muay Thai with, they talk about it being so deadly with the knees and elbows, but the majority of Muay Thai that we've come across is just a lot of, you know, there's a lot of wrestle fucking going on. You know, <laughs> there's, seriously, there's a tremendous amount of wrestle fucking going on in Northeast Muay Thai. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've never heard it term that way, but, yeah, but, then <laughs> but you it go, makes sense. And then you go to, but then you go to glory and K1 rules and the Muay Thai guys go, oh, but they don't elbow and clinch. Okay, take the elbow and clinch out of it. You're only allowed to manipulate the body by hitting it. Now let's talk about, let's talk about hard. Let's talk about contact. Let's talk about endurance. Carl will even tell you, a five-minute round in the UFC is easier than a three-minute round in glory because it's just go, 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 go. There's no stall. It's just hit and oh. hit and hit. Yeah, it sounds like it's, it's awesome. But it's different. So, you know, the perception of it all, people look at, like, again, a lot of Thai guys will be like, oh, glory's not as hard as Thai. Bullshit. Bullshit. It's hard. It's really hard. It's hard different, but oh, it's yeah, hard. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then... You know, then you get like people are thinking MMA is the hardest thing of all, whatever. MMA is the most diverse. It is the most technically challenged. But in terms of pace, I don't think it's as hard. I don't think the pace is as hard. I mean, but whatever. That's just me. As I say, just being a spectator, I find MMA to be the most boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Of how slowed down it is. I, I don't know. And I'm not a huge, I'm not a huge fan of grappling. So that could be part of it. I just don't see. But if you do watch MMA now. 90% of the fights are on their feet because the evolution of the sport Everyone has changed. Everyone got tired of watching. Well, no, uh, it's not that. It, no, it's guys got good at striking. Guys okay. are good. Right. It was originally a lot of wrestlers that I mean, went into Brazilian MMA. Brazilian jiu-jitsu is what this comes out of. I mean, the Brazilians okay. started it. The Brazilians are the ones that really made it what it is in popularity. And you had strikers coming into the game that couldn't wrestle. And you had wrestlers coming in that right. couldn't strike. And But then you get some really good strikers. And then the thought process changes. And people are like, oh, this striking thing can't just easily be defeated. So you give a striker with a good sprawl. Things start to change, whatever. Guys start cross-training more and more. And then, yeah, the science aspect of this really came in. And you've got world-class strikers world-class grapplers all in one human being now i mean everybody's world-class at pretty much everything that makes it to the top level if you're a top five guy in the ufc you pretty much can do you can do it all which neutralizes the ground game in a lot of ways these guys yeah, don't go to the ground okay, you don't see sense. as many submissions i mean in the beginning days it was if a guy got top mount fight was over right you punch him in the face he'd roll on his belly and you choke him out that doesn't happen anymore because guys know how to escape when a guy's on top Guys know how to escape when a guy's on your back. So you don't see as many arm bars and chokes. and You don't see as many finishes as you used to because everybody's really good. You see a lot more guys getting knocked out because everybody's getting dangerous. I mean, think about it. We Karate, I think, screws up a lot of stuff too because you, in martial arts terms, they talk about you need a lifetime to get good at something. And MMA in a lot of ways has proven that 
with the right coaching, you can get decent at things rather quick. Right. Like a couple of years to to be yeah, decent. To be decent. Yeah. If all you do is focus on the effective aspects of different sports and you don't – okay, you're not going to be a black belt in jiu-jitsu overnight. You're not going to be a world-class boxer overnight. You're not going to be a world-class kickboxer overnight. But you can throw a punch well. You can throw a kick well. You can sprawl well. You can defend def- defend jiu-jitsu well in a short amount of time. No, I'd absolutely agree And if that. you're a great athlete on top of it – And that's – yeah, exactly. That's a whole other aspect to throw into it is just genetic gift – and if you look at strength and conditioning, strength and conditioning is absolutely a science that's, that's, today. A, that's what I was going to say. It's a whole other level than when we were doing it. Oh, my God. I mean, we just went. Yeah, no. I mean, it wasn't even until near the end of my co- competing with you that we even touched weights, really. Yeah, it's like we started thinking about it. Yeah. We just, just like we we've set it up on the other side of the room and looked at it, <laughs> you know. Well, you, but even when we did it, though, it was do as many as you can – it was a lot of volume and not a yes. lot of focus on anything else. And that comes down to coming from the knockdown background where endurance is just so important. And the yeah. focus that we put on being mentally prepared to take the damage. So everything we did was how hard can you go? How far can you go? How, how much can you push? Right. You know. No, I mean, it, made, it all just fit into the same mentality. It fit into the same box. And so now guys are training way less than we used to train and are in way better shape and much more effective. Because you, because we learned over time, recuperation is just as important. I mean, we right. we didn't know the word recuperation. Well, we did, <laughs> we did to a degree. But again, when you grow up in a generation that's following a pattern of people that all they did was was talk about push, 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 push. You know, it, it was uh, coming from being inspired by a lot of the stuff we were inspired by. I mean, you watch all those Kyokushin videos from the 80s and you just see these guys like going. I mean, it was 100 man wall. fights yeah. and stuff like that, or it's what we're, we're looking at for inspiration. The sad part is a lot of these guys are dead now. Really? Yeah, because they're part of Generation S2, man. Yeah, yeah, that is a good point. You know? I mean, William Oliver, and I'm not disparaging this man in any way, but that was the dude. William Oliver was a guy who was one of the original Americans that did Kyokushin. He was very successful at it. The first world tournament back in 70-something. I think he took he took second or third or some shit like that. And he was a little dude. He was like 145 pounds. He was, he was my guy. size and lighter than me, yeah. Yeah, and he just put that Kyokushin way. They trained hard. They partied hard. They, they were just hard. They ate a lot. They <laughs> ran far. Like every single thing they did was an extreme. And they're dead. A lot of them are dead. They had heart attacks. Or, you know, weird stuff happened to him. I mean, hey, Andy Hoog was an amazing fighter. But, again, if anybody you knew him or of him knew that he was an extreme human being, he did everything to an extreme. And there's no way you're going to tell me that vitamin S was not a big part of him dying too. He died of leukemia in, in like, early 30s. He went from 185 to 227 pounds in a couple of years with, like, 3% body fat. That's not natural. No, you can't do not that. even a little. And I, I commend these people for the commitments that they made within the opportunities they had at the time. I'm never going to sit there and say, oh, he's crazy. He shouldn't have done it. At the time, there was no other way. Right. And I think when you get to the top level of any sport, regardless of what sport it is, when there's money involved, extracurricular Thank nutrition you. is also going to be involved. There's no There's too way much on the line. It. Exactly. I mean, I, we, I talked about it with Trent the other day, um, reiterating this. When Lance Armstrong got busted, they stripped him, but they didn't give the title to anybody else because it took them over to 100 cyclists before they found a clean sample. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, why? It's like, the all-drug Olympics. Even, it, well, right. <laughs> Just make it legal. and uh, that's, I, a whole I, other, that's a whole other argument. I, but. I'm not going to shit on somebody that was doing – what everybody else was doing at the time to be at the top. I mean, you can... Do you really want to be the crusader of your generation? It's really a great story to be the one guy (laughs) who, while everyone on the tour was dirty, you finished last, but you were clean. And you told everybody that you were clean. It doesn't work that way. You're not going to be famous for being a bum. You're going to be famous for being number one. You're better off fighting it from the inside. And I'm not saying to anyone, if you're in a sport that's doing a lot of drugs, go do drugs with them. But 
it's the reality put of the it situation. within context. In 2018, when we're having discussions about the long-term effects of these drugs at a much higher level, we're talking about CTE and things that we didn't even know existed when we started. Yeah, no shit. I just went to I Play America and Freehold My Son. We went on two little roller coasters. I still have a headache. I know I fucked myself up taking shots that I shouldn't have taken when I was younger. I don't know if you have effects from getting uh, Oh, I have the memory of a puppy dog. It's But you always did. Uh, it's I definitely, I, definitely I, I worse agree. after a couple of years of yeah. getting pounded in the head. Absolutely is. And if there's I, some times when I'm just like, I'll walk into a room with a plan of doing, getting, whatever, and I'm just like, why am I in this room? And I literally won't remember for like two minutes. Damn. I'll be like, what the fuck? The, like, I spend a tremendous amount of time knowing exactly what I'm thinking about, but I can't define it. That's the easiest way for me to describe it. So I know exactly who I'm speaking of, but I couldn't tell you his name if I wanted to. That happens a that lot, That is too. the feeling I get more than anything. And forget about it. I, I went to Great Adventure, and we went on a roller coaster. And it's like, okay, I'm good. And they're like, what's wrong? I was like, no, I'm good. I'm like, what's wrong? I'm like, I couldn't tell you what the day of the week is right now. My brain's not right. Like, I'm good. You guys go have fun. I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch. Just, just relax for a minute. I'm trying not to throw up right now. <laughs> you know, like I, we definitely did things to ourselves that were not right. But, yeah. but at the time, it's just what we had to do. That, but that was the way it was done, and that's who the people we were looking to for inspiration were doing it. So that's why, again, anybody who wants to shit on what was done. By taking it out of context and then shitting on it, that pisses me off. Because I'm like, you don't know what that time was like. Right. You, don't you didn't know experience who, it. You don't know who our heroes were. You don't know who we were trying to be. <laughs> we didn't know what they were doing wasn't going to well, be good whole, for us. Yeah, that's a whole other aspect of looking at it, too. Yeah. Is not actually knowing, you know, again, I was a lot younger back then you were just listening to me right and that wasn't even really an aspect of it at all i could look at back then i could look at andy hook and be like man yeah i want to be like that motherfucker yes and not even think about the fact that you know who knows what kind of cycle he was running what kind of gear he was on yeah that wasn't even something that crossed my mind i just thought that we didn't talk about it back then possible right because we did you might have talked about it with my dad but you definitely didn't talk about it but we didn't pull the curtain back as a society on the people that were doing this we just expected that of our athletes at the time. I mean, Barry Bonds, there was we, whispers about it later. I was going to say, it was all kind of ignored and just accepted. It was Mark silent Ma- until the yeah. was the baseball steroid nonsense. Mark McGuire was on special vitamins, you know? Like, <laughs> right. Lyle Alzado tried to say, I'm dying because of it. And everyone was like, we don't want to accept that yet. We like you guys really big and fast and strong and smashing each other. <laughs> you know, but if you, yeah, it's... I, I absolutely when when people because a lot of people tell me you guys were crazy I'm like no we weren't we were trying to be what we had for inspiration at the time so if you wanted to be Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the day you know Hulk Hogan's the perfect example he used to sit there and be like say your prayers take your vitamins <laughs> work out every day you'll be just like me and it's like no it's impossible to be like you I used to take Muscle Mass 3000 thinking I could be as big as Lyle Alzado. All I got was fat. (laughs) Like, Lyle Alzado was on testosterone and growth hormone and all that shit. Right. There was definitely a curtain that was drawn in front of everyone, and we just accepted it. It was just totally different. Yeah. And, I mean, now I look back and I'm like, well, I would like my knee back. I would like (laughs) my brain back. I wish my teeth would touch. But then at the same time... We wouldn't be where we are today if we did it. And that and, and and that's the throwback for for a lot of it is that you know, for me, man, look, not to get all like weird, but the the coolest moment for me was to see you get married. That was like that was the biggest victory of your career to me because I was and Jenya, when he made it into the military and did well, huge victory. You know, <laughs> Stein not dying. <laughs> the fact that he's still alive and able to function as a human yeah, that's being. A victory, that's yeah. a victory for us. Stein, you know we love you. But <laughs> just take it take it with a grain of salt. But you know, the the those are those things that make the the push factor that we did make sense. Cause ultimately like that's why we had that inspiration there because we spoke a little deeply about it it wasn't just winning it was it was forging a it was forging a strength that goes beyond just being able to fight but able to ultimately be able to live the way we want to and 
That's like, I even laugh. I see you have World's Strongest Nerd as, as your thing. Yeah, I changed that by Instagram handle. And I think that's awesome because you really do embrace who you are. You don't like you don't give a shit that you 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 like anime and you go to Comic Con and yeah you, you know what I mean like you wore a <laughs> leather... hang out and play video games with my wife and, yeah and you, you know, wore a leather top hat when you got married yes like, I did you you could and to other people's weddings there <laughs> I didn't know that but now I do but yeah there there's um, there's a strength in individual and strength of character and if the the ge- the generation that you came through here. I don't, I don't, um, I don't ever doubt the strength of individual of all of you because you guys went through something, and we did it all together in a way that I think there's a great value for all of us. Because so, even today, as the coach I, I am today, it's fueled by that that first round that and I and I lost it for a while because I don't know. I'll ask you about this, but I think there was a point. I think everyone gets it. Where you go through what we went through. And the separation's not always the best either. I mean, we didn't leave on bad terms. We didn't leave on good terms either for a while. And then you kind of find yourself outside of here, and then it all starts to make more sense, and then we're all cool again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's I mean, like, that, that, that is the exact way of putting it. There, yeah. there was definitely... Uh, I, I, even back then, I wouldn't say I was bitter about the way we did anything but it was oh there's animosity there for was, sure that, that's exactly there there's animosity for right sure. after there was you know i, I pretty much just because you know what i was told because so, you don't understand yet right Absolutely. you gotta grow into it <laughs> and then looking back on it there's a, an appreciation and a, and a fondness for it that, you realize there's a method to the madness exactly at some point. yep yeah it's kind of it's again it's like the kid that doesn't listen to their parents until they're in their 30s, and then they're like, oh, the, that old bastard really made a lot of fucking sense. I wish I listened to him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the funny part about it is for me, I uh, because I've never stopped teaching people, I have to deal with this every day. So, no, 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 meaning I never, I never got the, I've, I have, in 20 years, I haven't had the freedom to step away from it and change my perception of it because I'm still training you. Not you, but I'm training right. you every day. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm training a 20 something year old if not aspiring younger. something every day right. so i'm constantly in it and i'm constantly having to refine it so that i can create a better relationship with it so the tra- that weird transition is smoother and smoother and smoother <laughs> and the understanding of it has more value earlier and that's my, been my match pretty surprise i have um you remember randy mm, randy Manier? not offhand should i shaved head it's like my age Probably know him if I saw if him. If you saw him, you would know him. <laughs> Randy and I had a bit of a a, a, bit, a bit of a spat because he he just had a need that he wanted to go do something. Well, a he was almost forty and he wanted me to let him fight, and I was kind of like, dude, do you understand like taking a fight? Do you understand the, the the severity of what you're asking to do? And he had a back problem and different shit and whatever, and I was kind of not on board with it. But he really wanted, he really wanted, he really wanted, and it kind of led to us kind of drifting apart. And um, he started teaching a program. Without asking. He didn't ask me. Okay. He didn't tell me he was going to. I shouldn't say that. He didn't. It's not that he didn't ask. That's part of it, of the <laughs> old mentality. But he didn't tell me that he was going to do something. He just popped up at a school not far from us, and he started teaching a striking okay. program. And I called him up, and I was like, what the fuck, dude? Fuck. Like, <laughs> are you with me or not? And he was like, well, I guess I'm not. And I was like, well, who okay. and I, But I was like, kind of like, who do you think you are? And he literally said to me, he goes, bro, do I owe you any money? I'm like, no. And he's like, I showed up. I had a membership. I paid my dues. You taught me. I can go do whatever I want. It's a free country, man. Like, who do you think yeah, you are? Yeah. <laughs> but from the old mentality that we right. came with, yeah. it was beyond that. You don't do that. You don't do that. And I even said to him, I was like, bro, you're lucky it's not like 10 years ago and I don't have more free time because i probably find you and whoop <laughs> your ass right now. I, I, I straight up was like, yo, like, if you did this from a certain other – I threw another name out there. I was like, if you did this to so-and-so, he would probably be like at your house like choking you out on your front lawn right now. And he was like, are you threatening me? I was like, no, I told you what someone else would do. I didn't say I would do it, but I really wanted to. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. But uh, that was a huge bell ringer. I was like, damn, this is a financial relationship. This isn't family. This is a legitimate – this right. is, this is a business. They don't owe me anything. 
Right. They, they gave me what they owed me. It was it's money. A different, it's a different generation. But it's not of, even that. It's not, but it is. It's a, we had a different mentality. Okay, but and this is where I have departed completely. And we haven't had this really. I have really departed from the idea that anybody owes anybody anything. I The black belt, it held too much. Because I'm a black belt, way over fucking used. It ruined a lot of things. I can abuse you because... I can ask you to do shit I shouldn't be asking you because. You owe me because. You should because. Like way too far. And I was raised that way. And I don't even think I was that bad. No, that's what I was going to say is you didn't really – in certain aspects, you may have implemented it. clearly did. But in general, even looking back on it – I never, I guess I never looked at it that way. Uh, I, I, I did it. I never did anything on my own before speaking to you generally out of just respect, not because respect as a, per, yeah. a human to another human, not res, not even necessarily a, a senpai kohai thing or, you know, an instructor to a student thing. Just I mean, but we, to another but we person. Did, but we did feel comfortable as black belts in the organization to use violence to make a point. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there was we no, there was no problem whooping somebody down for being out of place. No. And being out of place in this weird culture that was based on respecting of this fucking belt around my waist. You Seriously. Admit, yeah. Like, we all... I, well, I, the shit that we went through to get that belt. And the shit I went through to get mine. Right. Which then I handed the shit down to you. And <laughs> yeah, then you right. handed all it down. All down and, but the thing for me on that one... When the bell goes off where I'm like, fuck, this guy doesn't owe me anything. He paid. He got. He can go do whatever he wants with it. He owes me nothing. Then started making me look at the process that much more. And the thing that I started to realize was I don't think I've been as bad as other people with it. I'm, I'm, I can't come out of this without, without you know, accepting certain things of myself and how I've gone about things. But uh, I see a lot of people taking advantage of – past accomplishments and quite honestly a black belt in a lot of ways represents past accomplishments a lot of people got their black belt and then coasted they go on coast mode and they teach but they teach in a way where it's like you should be privileged to be with me (laughs) versus i need to maintain my black belt by continuing to grow as a black belt and growing people instead of getting mine after because that's the thing when we're physically so hard on each other like so I got my ass kicked, so I kick your ass. So you kick the next guy, and they kick the next guy, and it's just kick the can over and over and over again. But at some point, we got to stop kicking the can, and we got to start reaching down and pulling people up versus constantly beating them down and saying, "Well, if you can keep getting up, you could be one of us." It right. misses a lot. It misses a lot. That actually, it's funny that you say that. That's something that I noticed um, in the strongman community is that we, it's the you know, granted, the only other community I've really been a part of yeah. is either our gym or, you know, the, the fight community in general. And uh, I'd say we're, we were kind of assholes back then. You think? A little Yo, bit. Yo, I own that shit. I'm good. <laughs> you can say whatever you want about it. I know exactly yeah, who I was, we, man. You know, in general, there was not the friendly... I mean, in our gym, we were all friendly to each other. But within the community... We're fucking we, Vikings, dude. That's exactly what I was going to say. Fucking Vikings. Whereas in the strongman community, I mean, even with the competitors in my own weight class, we're... You know, the day of the competition, we're competing. I'm not going to say, yeah. you know, we're we're going. But in general, there are people that, like, you know, I've never, you know, cheered for a competitor the way, like, the strongman community cheers for each other, even within the same weight you guys class also, on the same day. You're also not braining each other with your no. your weights either. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that is absolutely true, but it's still just it's such a different community atmosphere yeah. than anything else. It, it's almost like, you know, kind of almost like our gym, our personal the, yeah. training atmosphere. The whole but, community is a dojo. Exactly. Yes. That's awesome. And and what what uh but again, the coolest part about it now though is 
because you went through the system. If that community wasn't one big kumbaya... That would also be fine. You'd be fine. (laughs) Because at the end of the day... Built you to be a goddamn Viking. Well, right. <laughs> if and you that, have to pull out the horned helmet, you will. <laughs> and that's still pretty much one of the. I mean, you know, the same thing when I uh, when I was you know on fight day, I'd sit in the corner by myself with my headphones on and just kind of get in my own little yep. zone. And that's still yeah. pretty much exactly what I do at competitions. Uh, maybe a little friendlier, and I maybe have my wife with me, but that's really. You know, it's pretty much the same. Yeah, but it's still a big fuck you to that weight that you got to well, lift. Well, that's and exactly a fuck you to the yeah, guy that, wa- it, that wants to try and lift more than absolutely. you. Absolutely. But that's why you're a competitor. Yeah. Because, I mean, all competitors have that. All competitors do. All good competitors. <laughs> all good competitors have that. Because that's the fire. That's the fire in the belly. That's the, I, I, I want to win. I mean, Carl's got it. Carl oh, wants absolutely. to kill everybody. Carl wants to kill everybody, but he doesn't want to kill you. He does when the bell rings. Right. And when it's over, high five, hug, whatever. We're good. I mean, it, it, it's not. That's the thing. I think um, we've become much more of a sport now. It's a lifestyle, but the mentality is definitely. Look, I don't know. Like the community is still as fractured, and we still are the pirate ship coming in when we show up at another gym. <laughs> They're all associated with big something or others, and we're still one school kicking the shit out of big guys. It's still what we do. And no offense to anybody, we, we, have, a, we have a lot of love for the people that help us out. And we have a lot of people that see value in working with us, and we really do appreciate that. Um, we play as well with others as we possibly can. So, Which has not always been terribly well. Well, no, no. You know what it is? Here's my rule. And and it's my biggest complaint in everything. It's not just martial arts or whatever. It's in life. It's the motherfuckers that have an inflated opinion about themselves to the point where they feel that they can treat you better, treat you worse than they expect you to treat them. Okay. I don't respect that Absolutely ever. Not. So when someone tells me to that they're not comfortable with me doing something, well, the litmus test for me is like, okay, if you don't want me to work with this guy or you don't want me to talk to that guy – don't you fucking do it, you know? Because right. I get that where guys will ask me to like not work with somebody or whatever, and I'm like, okay, but when, but I mean, like, as like a business or like somebody from one gym will ask you not to go to another gym. Is that kind of what you mean by kinda, that? It could be that. It could be hey, or a business associate or asking a guy you not that, to work with or another if a business. guy from. Here's the one that happens all the time. Somebody leaves school A, comes by me, and goes, mm-hmm. "Hey, I used to work out at that place. I want to join your school." Okay. I always call the other instructor and I say, hey. Hello, I, and then I always call up the other instructor and I say, hey, um, one of your guys, one of your former guys came by. Do you have a problem? And they'll either say no or they'll say yes. If you <laughs> say yes, you have a problem. If one of my guys calls you up, you better fucking call me. And you better fucking respect what I have to say about it. Because okay. if you don't, well, then gloves are off. Then I'm going after everybody. Okay. Like If you give me the same respect that you're asking me to give you... We're good. But right, you, instead of just taking their money and being quiet. Or just completely disrespecting me when you're right. asking me to respect you. Right. Like, that happens too many times. Like, I'm lucky. Like, I've got, like, Nick Catone has been super awesome with us. We've Like, he's been really awesome with us. And Ricardo Almeida's organization has been really awesome with us. They let Carl come and train. They've let other guys come through. They've been really good. And I'm very respectful of that relationship. But there are other people that we've worked with that have done weird things the community of people that i think are good in this sport and like cool it's very small like there's not a lot of people that i'm like i'm not overly cool with a massive amount of people (laughs) because not everybody really understands where i'm coming from right so i can see that and i don't even think these guys i'm saying are cool understand where i'm coming from either i just think that they they give me some respect because i think i bring something to the table for them too so Oh, my son's hopping and he wants to sit on my lap while we, 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 we do the rest of this, which is fine. But now, now he wants to talk into the mic. But, but um, you know, that it, that's the one thing. And I don't care if it's business or if it's training or whatever. But I, it's, it, you know what it's like? I think sparring is, is where everything. It's the guy who says, take it easy, who's throwing bombs. Right. And that's, always, <laughs> that's kind of always been something that was always a problem. Back in the day, it was, you know, oh, you know, oh, we're just going easy today. We're just going easy. And then they'll just they'll throw something just to kind of sucker punch you. And then, when catch you, you and, off then guard. and then you drop the hammer. Right. And they think you're the dick. Exactly. 
That's 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 the part that bothers me. Oh boy, my son is trying to hop in. Hi, hi, hi. I think he just blew out Jay's eardrums a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. So you know, the it it it's it's getting that. I, I guess the, the, the power of the mutually beneficial trade is really the thing that I've kind of gotten to a place where I've really gone to appreciate. And that goes back to what we were talking about with like the black belt thing. I don't think – I think a lot of people because of the shit they went through to get their black belt, they don't feel like there's a mutually beneficial trade sitch anymore. They feel like there should be more benefit towards them because of what they did in the past. And that's the part that kills me and that's the part I evolved from where – I don't think anybody owes me anything for anything I've ever done. It's only the value that I can communicate today based on what I've done. You know, so it's like we may so the things we did together instead of walking around and not doing much except tell stories about that. Right. I learned from it and I evolved. And I'm a better instructor today because of it. So there's a huge value to what we did. Cur- that's current right learning from what we did the mistakes that we made and the you know and successes it, that we had and, both I, and I look important. at what you do now as the same evolution of the process because you've continued to apply that time to the things you do but you're evolving your application of it to find success in all the things you do yeah no, I would agree with that so definitely. like that's why you so We've been going for a while. I just want to grasp um, a little bit about... So you started doing this strongman. Yeah, that's actually where we, we got way off topic. <laughs> we got way off topic. But the I one thing I, I'm really curious about is with... Um, so I think I got into it about three or four years, but three how years do you, ago but like how do you, summer. But how do you go from like lifting in your garage to going to the world's strongest man? Uh, yeah, I mean, really what they, um, this was the first year that they, they dubbed it the official strongman games. It was the first time the parent company that does the world's strongest man, uh, started offering the, the smaller weight classes and the guys that do the world's strongest man, they go off to like the middle of nowhere, some country, and the whole thing takes place over two weeks, and then it's edited for television. Gotcha. So it's more of like a sports entertainment show yeah. than like watching a live competition. And you know, for one, two, three, four, uh, I don't know, twelve or so weight classes, if not more, including women and masters and etc. They obviously aren't going to do something like that. Yeah. So what they ended up doing was they picked it. You know, again, from my understanding, they picked the date. Um, it was down December sixteenth and seventeenth in Raleigh, North Carolina, and back in the summer of twenty seventeen, they announced it that they were going to be doing. They were going to be the first year offering the weight classes for the um 80 kilogram 90 kilogram 105 kilogram uh for the men's for the title of world's strongest man and they were doing 10 i believe they were doing 10 personal invitations to in each weight class how'd you get attention how they? How did well, they know that, to that, talk to? That's basically what I was getting to. They were doing th- about thirty spots per weight class, and they were doing ten individual um, invitations to people they knew that they wanted, people that had already won, you know, major contests, this, that, and the other thing. I was not one of those guys. Um, so you're talking about guys that have won nationals, guys that have won one of the other. There's like two other world class competitions that are held. Um, guys that have gone to the Arnold, etc. I wasn't one of those guys. <laughs> so <laughs> I've only been in the sport for three years. Uh, so they, um, the other twenty odd spots, they were doing uh, an online leaderboard type deal. Kind of, I think they got the idea from CrossFit, like how they do the okay. the open is yeah, like an yeah, online yeah, yeah. deal. So what they had done was they were leaving the you know other about 20 spots open for this leaderboard per weight class, and they laid down the rules back in the summer. It was for, um, you had to video, they basically chose three events. They gave you a description and a video of how they wanted them done. You had to weigh your implement in, in one continuous video, um, do the event, 
and weigh your implement after so that there was no real way obviously again if somebody really wanted to they probably could have cheated but then if they made it yeah to that you're gonna high, look like an idiot exactly you're gonna look like an asshole so you know in the community it really you had a bunch of naysayers you know they go oh, but really anybody that actually is gonna get there they're probably not going to cheat to get there because they don't want to look like an asshole. That, so that's actually – it's pretty cool to have that that opportunity. I mean I can understand that a purist or somebody that's earned their way there is going to get pissed off that somebody can kind of video their way in. But it's kind of cool though. It brings well, – it, it, Right. They're really looking for – the strongest Who person. is going to be the strongest in, yeah. in their respective weight And class. there's garage trained people that are strong as fuck Absolutely. out there. I mean, there are guys, you know... I see your Instagram. Even, even at the top level that, you know, maybe not all the time, but they train on their own. Um, yeah, I mean, there's guys at the top level who, you know, it's a different kind of community than the fight community. You don't need a whole, you know, a whole gym behind you. You don't have to train with other people. So it really allows the individual to kind of do what he wants. I mean, there's guys like... So the like, garage guy. I mean, I'm watching you. Like, I'm watching your videos on Instagram. I mean, you're training in your garage. In the yeah, no, your garage it, it's literally my equipment. garage and out... And I mean, we, me and my wife bought our house pretty much because of its... Well, one of the biggest pushing aspects of it was I live at the end of a street at a dead end. I have like 200 feet that I can train in the road and not have to worry about traffic. So I can take my heavy bullshit implements out to the middle of the road and leave them set up there like an asshole and 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 carry around, you know, three, four, five hundred pounds and not have to worry about moving it for a car. And and your dad told me you're into welding now and you're making your own equipment and stuff. Yeah, I uh, started picking that up at my old job and then, you know, bought myself some equipment, some machinery and just started going to work on it that's awesome so you're literally one of these garage guys who makes it so you make it there how tough was it that was definitely the hardest competition that i've had to do that i uh, yeah no that that was some of the weights were they were within my range but they were definitely at like the top end of it where did you where did you end up in the overall for your i believe 18th out of 27th Okay, it's respectable first, first time. First time garage. going to Worlds. The guys are in the top. What's what's the difference between the guys in like top five versus number eighteen? They are they're just most of them, if not all of them. I mean, the top ten guys, basically the guys that you that you that got their personal invite, the guys that you, yeah, the, the guys that the producers knew they wanted there were just they're on a different level. They when they're on a different animals. level, it's because. But is it because they're more organized? They come out of a system. They come out of gyms where they have where, coaching. What is it? What's the what's the separate? I think a lot of it is just time. Time that they've been in the sport. Time that they've been training. I what's mean, the average age of the best guy? Probably. I mean, if he's been in the sport long enough, probably closer to my age. I mean, 30, 35. Yeah. Um, just as an, I mean, it's hard to say for. Again, I haven't. Ta- you know, I've gotten friendly with the, a lot of these guys, but I haven't talked to them all that much. But just looking at like the pro level, like Zadrunas Saviskas is he just turned like forty recently, Wait, and he is an eight-time Arnold winner, four-time World Strongest Man winner, and he well, just turned like forty, forty-one. But the thing about that is that. We have the ability up to, I believe it's 63, to improve on strength. Cardio starts to drop at 34, but we have the ability as humans to keep evolving strength going up to about 60. And if you look at it from a, from a human perspective, just on biology, when we're younger, why do you need cardio? Because oh, you're the hunter. Well, that's, yeah. You have to be able to take the animal down. But then as you get older... You have kids, and they start hunting for you. <laughs> but you have to be strong because being strong is what protects you. If you fall, you get back up. You need right, that makes sense. You need strength to carry yourself through your later years, where you need the cardio combined with the strength to be the you know the hunter of the tribe when you're younger. That's really how we evolved with evolution. So no, we that have makes the, a lot of sense. I've, never, I've honestly never really given but it a lot. But of it's thought. true. But it's this yeah. is like scientific stuff. This is not. I'm not sitting there like, oh, this is my opinion. If you read about the evolution of of human beings, it's it's that's legitimate. Crazy one, infants. In a loud room, t- 
tend to be more quiet than a quiet room because when we lived in the forest, the loud baby got eaten. The quiet baby survived. That makes sense. So it's, again, an evolution of just people from being, you know, right. hunter-gatherers in the woods to what we are now. So, But if you understand your evolution, you realize that there's a tremendous amount of potential for you to still gain your strength. But where you're going to get fucked is on the cardio side because I noticed there's a lot of cardio well, involved. That is the funny thing. Because your I heart's mean, got to be strong to carry that damn car for the distance yeah, you got to carry it. Yep, and that's the funny thing. I mean, a lot of people like to compare Strongman to CrossFit, and it's actually a pretty apt comparison, except Strongman's a hell of a lot heavier most of the time. Yeah, I think CrossFit is truly a muscle endurance thing. These guys can put up some heavy weights, but the endurance factor that they're going through is... Pretty right, it's a hell of a lot more endurance, and usually, and that's that's the funny thing is, a lot of the cross the top CrossFit guys are actually incredibly strong, but not for they're not the, strongman strong because strongman strongman. It's not right exactly. It's not, it's not who can lift the weight the longest, who's can lift the heaviest goddamn weight the most number of times. Yeah, or just once depending on the event. But yes. yeah, but it's really to find out who's. I think CrossFit's more physical strength, and I think it. CrossFit is sustained horsepower. The yes. strongest man yep. is more just raw horsepower. I would agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. So that what and what's cool though is, is again taking from your experience, being able to apply it. So having the ability to generate that raw horsepower, it, it it's probably almost a relief that it doesn't have to be five three minute rounds <laughs> I, I would definitely agree and that's that's the funny thing as well is it it is a surprising amount of still cardio of yeah. still uh, i guess it would yeah it would be muscular endurance how many guys do you see videos of passing out doing maxing out on deadlift your heart's hammered maxing out or even i mean again it, it, on the instagram or you know at, at worlds we had to do car deadlift for reps i mean I, yeah and that was the only event of that day that I didn't do particularly great at, and that's more of a deadlift issue than an endurance issue. But, I mean, you know, try picking up an SUV. The top guys hit between 12 and 16 reps Yeah. with something that was, I think the curb weight was, I don't know, 4,000 pounds. Yeah, I don't know what it ends insane. up in your hands, but it, it was heavy, if I can tell you well, that. Well, that's the thing. People try and say that strength is not cardio, and I'm like, bullshit. You need do oxygen. Tw- yeah, do a 20-rep squat set and get it's back just, to me on that. It's different. It is. It's just it different. It absolutely is. It's good, but you need you need oxygen to do everything. Well, right, and even you still get guys, and the top level guys are never going to say it. But you get the the weekend warriors that think they know everything. Oh, you don't need to do cardio and strong man. It's just about lifting heavy and this and that. It's like the better you can recover yeah. between events, the better you're going to do in general. And that's like regular bullshit steady state cardio to yeah. get better at that. Just your general heart health. Well, it's even if you look at boxers, the best strength and conditioning coaches I work with boxers don't work on pressing motions. And the bro science people are like, "Bro, I want to punch hard, so I'm going to bench press." <laughs> you know, but your better your best punchers are working on pulling motions because the more well-rounded your body is, the better off you are. So, right. I remember um Oh my god, the guy from Muscle and Fitness. Who is the who is the um who is the the oh god I, I, the bodybuilding guy and the the guy who was in charge of bodybuilding who is like the creator of muscle and fitness oh was it Weeder yes Weeder okay. thank you <laughs> see the punch <laughs> two punch drunk brains make half a brain uh, <laughs> Joe Weeder yeah okay from what I've gathered this is not fact nobody sue me for the statement I'm about to make but from what I've gathered Joe Weeder was one of the biggest proponents of steroids ever. And Sounds about right. That's what it. But Muscle and Fitness, you ever read it? They made it sound like it was like an organically healthy magazine. But <laughs> he, from everything I've ga- gathered, anybody that worked with him was definitely doing stuff. But I remember he worked with Evander Holyfield back in the day, like okay. after one of the Tyson fights, and he put a ton of weight on him. Go figure. I will mm. not say why, but I think I already alluded to what it was why. But they were doing tons of pull ups, and they were doing deadlifts, and they were doing things that were counter motions to what boxing was and he explained it as the balance factor and then that kind of a bell went off and then i started to look into it and that actually is the science of better human performance is that if you're 
in a sport that requires a lot of pushing, if you but endurance pushing, if you need quick, snappy pushing motions like a punch, if you're spending a tremendous amount of time doing bench press and push ups at slow or heavy or whatever, you're training your body to be strong and slow when you need to be fast. So you have to have a solid foundation in which to create speed. And speed is created by counter motions, not just a forward motion. So if I'm punching with my left hand, I'm pulling with my right and pushing with my left. So I have to have the ability to pull just as much as I have to push to generate the maximum amount of force. I'm getting all right. deep on the science e- on this. Even so, when it gets right down to it, you know, you need a good base. Your your back and your legs are your base for your punching, so your the, kicking, the your most, whatever you're doing. So the more balance you get in your overall conditioning, the better you're going to be in your sport-specific sport. So if you're going into strongman saying that you don't need cardio, right. but if you do have cardio, you're going to be a better machine. Right. So you're going to be stronger longer than the next guy, which absolutely does matter. Yep. Uh, absolutely. So yeah. you have to you have to touch on all of it, but you don't have to put – so if you're in strongman, you're not going to go run a marathon. Hell no. But you're going to train cardio because if you still smart, need endurance. You, you should, yeah. So it's creating again – And just general, just general heart health. I yeah. I mean it's not as much of a worry for me. I'm a smaller guy. And you're not on steroids. <laughs> right. But <laughs> for, for the bigger guys, you know, it's that whole heart health thing. It's an absolute necessity. Yeah, so the more balanced you are, the better you're going to be in anything you do for sure. So that, yeah, it's it, it, that's the science aspect of it when you really go deep on this and you get past the bro science. The bro science still kills me. I get a, <laughs> I, I, I get so many people that I just have to re-educate them to how the body works. Even with training for fights, people don't understand that if you're in elite physical condition, it's 14 days before you start to lose performance. If you sat on the couch and did nothing, it would take 14 days before you started to degrade. Right. And that's, again, we're talking to some of the people that we mutually know. That's the funny thing is they just, you know, they still have that bro mentality. Yeah, yeah. so they got to train up until, like, fight day because they don't want to lose cardio. And I'm like, you're not going to lose cardio. Right. When I was well, training Kurt Pellegrino, he had a strength coach that literally locked him in a hotel room for seven days and, like, don't do anything. Because he was like, no, I got to train, I got to train, I'm going to get weak. And he was like, no. And they literally would like lock him down. By the time fight time came, he was recovered. He was well, energized. It's that whole tapering process And he process was like too. running to the cage and like ready to explode because he had more energy than he had the whole camp. Right. No, how, ab- absolutely. That's- how, how many times for us though, this is for our own experience, I used to have the week, the Saturday after a Saturday fight, I would spar and feel amazing. <laughs> Because all I did was, like, eat and drink right. and sleep yep. and, like, totally recover. No, that was even, yeah, when I did uh, Nationals last year at the end of June, there were some parts of it that, uh, you know, I-, I felt pretty decent. I did okay in some of the events, not so great in others, but that was other reasons. But then I think a week or two after I pull, you know, I think I, I hit, um, at the time, a personal best on the log and a personal deadlift best, like, two weeks after what should have been my best performance, yeah. and it was because I wasn't injured, and I did nothing but, like, eat and bullshit. Yeah, so you learn, though, <laughs> but it's funny, though, I apply that now to training with guys, uh, like, on fight week, just don't do that much. Like, yeah. seriously, just make weight. Just make weight. <laughs> and do, and make weight. In, in the least amount of effort possible. That's all. Yeah, absolutely. We used to cut weight over time, but the one we got smart is when we did swamp water, which we'll get into that another time, but yeah. we had a method of, of hydration we called swamp water, which was instead of just using water, we had uh, vitamins in it, and the water looked murky and shitty, so we called it swamp water. But um, you know, we, we, we would hydrate. Instead of dehydrating out over weeks, you just dehydrate in an extremely short – it was a rapid dehydration in a short amount of time so your body wasn't fucked up for that long. You would try and stay in a state of your weight for – like the weight you had to make. We would make it in the shortest amount of time possible so that our body didn't go into a fatigue state. I see these guys that are cutting weight over a couple days and I'm like, you've got three days of, of – just totally massacring your body now you only have 24 hours to kind of get your shit back together and now you got to go fight yeah you want you want to stay sucked out for an hour not three days and then you're 
you know, your muscle fibers tearing because they don't have enough water. You know what I mean? It's crazy. But I see guys that still do that. The UFC Performance Center is really amazing because they have, like, um, Lockhart, the nutritionist, and they have all these doctors, and they have all these different things, and they, they do body composition, and they put together a plan that these guys can strip down. Carl made 185 last time, didn't even go in the sauna. What did he start? What was he before the wake up? Uh, fight week. He was at like 198 the week of the fight. Like he woke up like Sunday or Monday at 198 and went down to 186 in a couple of days and never – he ate every day. He never skipped meals. Nice, yeah. Didn't skip water. Like literally just coasted right into it. Didn't have to do any of the crazy – I mean before – fight week we well the way up. we used to do shit back in the day was not a pleasant experience but we didn't know i mean right. okay so when carl fought at glorious last time to make 185 the week of the fight on sunday he was 212 okay so he went from 212 to 186 oh, but the day before the weight cut he was like 209 so we went from 209 to 186 in a matter of about a day oh my god I mean, it was monster. But the reason that we were having the problem, we go to the UFC and we find out. They put him in. They scan his body. So he has to make 186. He has 183 pounds of muscle. So the problem ended up being that literally the weight class he was trying to make barely made enough accommodation for his muscle mass, his organs, skin, hair, bones. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So he was just too big. He couldn't make it. The reason we were having trouble making it is because literally he was too big. So <laughs> the UFC put together a plan and they said you need to get your muscle mass down to this, whatever. But they did this body scan. They figure out what everything weighs and they say, okay, the days you train this, eat that. And this is the cardio you have to do. And they literally got his muscle down to like 170-something pounds. Well, right. So you're saying, yeah, basically his muscle, at say 10% body fat, his muscle and bone composition should be uh, 165, 170 pounds, and plus a healthy amount of fat so he doesn't, you know, so he can actually be an athlete. He's not a bodybuilder. Yes. So they had him running. I mean, he was literally running. or if He, he was running for an hour, like five days a week, and he stripped all the muscle down. It was a nightmare. But he was eating, you know. Right. 3,500 calories a day. You know, he's training two to three times a day, right. eating a tremendous amount of calories, not eating a lot of carbs. The prote- It was like protein, a bit of starch, strategy, whatever. But it was a very specific – but it was a very specific diet to accommodate the work that he was doing. But again, it was syst- it was a systematic approach right. to it and we had a very specific goal. Like when you're flying blind, I think you weigh this – because I don't have the tools, <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, no, it's absolutely. really tough, and that's what we dealt with. And I mean, now well, even yeah, science is more totally so. advancing yeah. us now. Like before, it would be like, shut the fuck up, drop twenty pounds, like right. just do it. Like you'll, we'll suck it out. You, you, you It'll know, be fine. It's like you've cut fifteen pounds. Nobody died. We're okay. We didn't know. <laughs> you know, we almost killed one guy. We almost killed one guy. We had uh, Amir. Amir when he when uh, he showed up on fight day for that one amateur fight and he was like 18 pounds over I swear he had a stroke in my car on the way to Lang City and I don't and, and I don't think he was ever the same after that either I think I think we screwed him up I think we did something wrong to him I don't know so if Amir's listening to this don't hold me to that one I, I'm sorry we didn't mean to do it <laughs> but that was his fault he showed up he told us oh I'm only a couple pounds out he shows up like 20 pounds out oh uh, best one ever the time Jenya we did the water cut with him right and we told him that he would do a gallon of water 24 hours out from the fight. He had to cut it. But he drank a gallon of water on the day of weigh-ins. Oh, Jesus Christ. Don't you remember I, that? I do remember that, yeah. And then, and, and that would be a gen... That's classic. Classic gen, yeah. <laughs> and then we threw, him on the, the, we, we threw him on the elliptical until he got the water off. And then he got off and he goes, I'm really thirsty. Can I have something to drink? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like... And I was like, dude, you just got all the water out of you. You're going to have to go back on if you drink anything. Okay, okay. Can I eat a hot dog or something? And I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna kill this kid. I remember I made someone else drive him. I wouldn't drive with him because I was so mad at him that I wouldn't drive with him. We right. almost missed the fight over it. And it's genius. So you couldn't actually tell if he was just fucking with you or if he. No, was he was being just that genuine. dumb. We just knew he was that dumb. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. No, he was that dumb. Like seriously, he was like a golden retriever. <laughs> like he was like a 15 year old golden retriever. That was insane. And he smashed uh, the dude in that fight. I remember that was the one. Was that up in Canada? No, that was the New York fight. The, the Canada fight didn't go so well. New nah. York was different. New York, he just he murdered the dude, but he kept his hands down the whole time for that one too. Ah, uh, yes, I do remember that one. But he murdered the guy. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> the best one with him was when he got knocked out in Canada for the second time, and he woke up and he goes, "Fuck Canada! I don't want to fight Canada anymore." <laughs> Because he uh, fought that kickboxing bout, he murdered the guy, and then yeah. the guy realized this kid's got his hands down, and he knocked his head off with like a second you left in the last you round. You fucking warned him right before it happened. Dude. I basically Keep his hand it up. I was like, you told, you told the other guy. Yeah, I basically <laughs> told the other guy, his hands are down, punch him in the face. Because I was yelling the whole time, hands up, hands up, Jenya, put your hands up, hands up, crack. Yeah, and then, brutal. and then, and then the knockdown fight was the same one. Yep, he was cracked like, right in the back of the head on that one. Oh God. And I'll never forget that I put the video of that one up, and it's really funny because in the video, right before this dude knocks him out, you hear a cell phone ring, and somebody put in the comments, that's his mom (laughs) calling to tell him to duck. (laughs) (laughs) That was like the best comment ever on a video. So, look. I've got my kid here, and he's sick and tired of waiting for us. So here's the deal: we're gonna have you back because I really okay. want to get into strong men more. We did a um, a it lot was more of, of an old school. I, I was reminiscing about up, yeah. old school a little bit Same, more than haven't anything. Seen each other I haven't seen while. you in a while, and, and uh, we haven't talked about things in a while. But uh, I want to bring you back because I want to get a little bit more into strong men and talk about things. But uh, tell people where they can find out more information about you. What's your What's your Instagram? Uh, I believe it's at uh, World's World Strongest Nerd at Instagram. At in, yeah, that's is that your Instagram primary? Handle. Is that your primary social media thing? Um, yeah, yeah, I would say so. I don't so, really, I don't do the Twitter or the Snapchat thing. I don't even really know what they are. I'm, all a, right, I'm so, an old man in that regard. So follow you on Instagram <laughs> or, at World Strongest Nerd. You can find me on Facebook too. Yeah, but Instagram know. is the most interesting. Yeah, for you. I would actually. I just message you on Facebook because yeah. Messenger is cool. So, but uh, <laughs> Instagram is really the only one I actually, I guess, use in any. And you do have, whatsoever. and you, you actually have some cool videos of your lifts and the different things you do. Yeah, so that really my, is the way to find out about yeah, what you do. I put my lifts up there, my competition stuff, my welding stuff, pretty much anything. If if I make it or do it, I'll have pictures or video up of there of it. Just and you, shits and giggles. And you are pretty much an anime and comic book geek, so we do and have video to have, games and yeah. video games. So we'll, we have to have a comment. What I'll do, I get Carl on because the one thing with Carl is he plays a lot of games. So maybe you guys can have a conversation about. Maybe uh, he probably plays like that Call of Duty what shit. What do you play? And uh, God, um, I mean, I was super into Street Fighter, but then Street Fighter Five came out and fucked that game. Oh uh, my god, <laughs> that's like some serious nerd shit right there. Like I'm, I'm totally not understanding because I, I have a four year old, so I play Lego. Well, I know you know Lego what Street Star Fighter Wars. was, of, yes, because of course my but, generation created Street Fighter. So, exactly. so watch it. Be careful, <laughs> careful. You're messing with, 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 with uh, holy ground there, but. <laughs> So you yeah, can, if me, you, and Carl should definitely do do an episode. That would be probably entertaining. It'll be the most useless episode we ever oh, do, absolutely. but you may find some humor in it. Um, so, Jay, again, it, w- it was great to have you on to catch up. We'll get your dad on here, too. Your dad yeah. will be interesting. Your dad can tell us some crazy stories about back in the day. Honestly, I really want to put if more he can stuff. remember them. Well, no, he can remember. The one I want to, because I think the statute of limitations has gone off on it, but I want to hear about the Grateful Dead movie. From Convention Hall in Asbury Park. I don't know anything about that. You're gonna have to talk to him about that. One. That one, I got it. I got to get some more details on that one. So, because I think everybody involved is either dead or been put away already. So, <laughs> yeah, Jay, Jay's dad was literally he OD got into on some that shit. one. He yeah. was definitely a gangster from the classic Asbury Park. So, but. You can find out more information about me, Mr. Brian Wright. I'm at Brian Wright seven three two on Instagram and on Twitter. You can follow the gym, KillerBCSA.com. You can find us, uh, KillerBCSA, on Instagram and Twitter as well. We're all over Facebook and all that. Uh, TheHiveCast.com to get more episodes. Uh, this has been going rather well. You know, yeah, no, it was a lot of yeah, fun. Bringing more people on, getting more stuff. I, I like bringing on the old school guys, too, talk about who we were and <laughs> kind of figure out how we got to where we are especially with it being a 20 year anniversary we got to bring more oh old school God, people on yeah years, man right? 20 years 20 years 1998 i started this march of 1998 so march will officially be 20 okay. years but it's our our 20th year so but yeah again the hivecast.com to get more episodes here we're also on tune in google play itunes we're all over so actually you could find us on alexa if you say the Hive okay. podcast, we pop up on Alexa because TuneIn is tied into that. Is it? Yes. 
So making it a lot easier. And we got to thank uh, the, all the people that make our athletes strong and make this gym possible, which would be Sucker Punch Entertainment, definitely the management company you want to be with if you're an athlete on the way up. If you're looking for the proper way to get your fuel, go to Mule Plans to go. They were really instrumental in Carl making the weight. Before that, Carl's not the best cook. And <laughs> Carl's family doesn't really eat the way he needs to eat. So Meal Plans to Go really got him going. And the one thing about Meal Plans to Go is they use really good ingredients and they work with you on stuff. There are other meal plan places that they hit the calorie count and they hit the right ratios, but their source of food I don't feel is as good. Okay. And you know for you, that's really important too, your food. I know how you eat. You're, you're very – you're very into your, your your diet there, and you've played around a lot of things yeah. to maximize your strength, yeah, body weight, I've all that. Definitely had. Uh, it used to be a struggle. It used to be a struggle to make weight, and I haven't had a problem making weight in a couple of years now. So yeah. it's really nice to be on the other side of the fence on that one. Yeah. So if you're having trouble with it, check out Meal Plans to Go, and then uh, Pure Spectrum CBD oil. No joke. We started using uh, Pure Spectrum here and there. You know me. I got a terrible neck. My yeah. neck, literally from the age of 34, I've pretty much been in pain consistently. I've taken CBD oil here and there. I don't even take it that much. And I've had now weeks at a time where I don't have the pain in my neck anymore. So Pure Spectrum, it's really good. Check them out. Uh, Alienware, they've been a big sponsor of the team. And uh, New Jersey Nutrition, they've been really good to Carl in particular, getting him everything he needs with his proteins and, and all those vitamins that he takes so it's all good uh i think that's pretty much it on my shout outs for now i can't yeah, think I, of anything else i don't have jade any, says so. like i don't I, have any sponsors i don't so have any you. sponsors i don't have anybody paying attention to me yep. i have no. to i have to work a real job and train on my free time and i don't have any sponsors so fuck you well we have to start working on that so <laughs> actually if you are interested in working with the world's strongest nerd check out that instagram feed and uh, again follow us thehivecast.com brian right 732 on instagram and twitter i've said it multiple times um uh, yeah i think we've said what we've had to say we'll have a part two to this rather soon i've got uh dr mike actually coming on tuesday Still trying to work getting Shane the Barber. And then Keith from Bulldogs and Barbells. We were all set up to do this, but uh, he's had some issues with his work being just completely slammed, which is the, the best problem to have. So trying to get him out of the gym to come here has been a little bit difficult, but we're still working on getting that done. So a lot of new guests, a lot of different things going on, and I'm going to stop wasting all of our time. All right, this is the Hive Podcast. We are out.